Good evening to you. For Telesur, I'm Regan Devines in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with this evening's headlines. With the message of no more austerity and an end to racism, British politician newcomer Jeremy Corbyn just may have, just may become the next leader of the Labour Party. Venezuelan Foreign Minister calls Colombia out on his role to end the border violence. And Chile pays tribute to a former presidential hero. This and more now on From the South. Good evening to you and thank you for being with us. We start in Britain where a left-wing politician who was a little known until a few months ago could be about to upset the entire political establishment. Jeremy Corbyn is the clear favourite to win the election for leader of the Labour Party, which is the main opposition to the Conservative government. Voting closed on Thursday and the result will be announced early this Saturday. The party has seen a huge influx of new members mainly young people, attracted by Corbyn's clear message against budget cuts, war and racism. I'm trying to open up the democratic process and unleash that fantastic potential that's there. People have had enough of the politics of abuse and the politics of control. This is about the politics of democracy. I just feel like there is this huge groundswell now and whatever happens at the weekend is going to continue and ordinary people can be heard. He's very much the man of the people, you know, uh, and he really is a champion for the little people like us. So that is what we want from our uh, politicians. He's a public servant, basically. Corbyn's long-standing opposition to British military action overseas has also been a central feature in his campaign. He's now challenged Prime Minister David Cameron to justify Britain's use of drone attacks in Syria. I'm concerned at the legality of the Prime Minister's decision to launch the drone strikes. I did call in my question to him on Monday for there to be a political conference in the whole region, which would, of course, have to include Iran as well as Russia, USA, European Union, and all the neighboring countries as a way of cutting off the arms supplies and money to ISIL, as well as preventing ISIL selling oil and making money from it. If we just go in bombing, civilians will be killed, and I suspect there will then be a call for ground forces to follow. There is no parliamentary authority for military action as of now. It was rejected in 2013. Telesuru Stephanie Kennedy is in London and she explains the mood there one day before the results are announced in this extraordinary election. Good afternoon, Regan. Well, here from London, tomorrow, around about midday, the next leader of Britain's main opposition party, New Labour, will be announced. Now, for an internal election of a political party, never, has, never before has so much controversy, interest and debate been generated. And this is thanks in large part to candidate Jeremy Corbyn. Now, Jeremy has been a member of the Labour Party for more than 30 years, but never before has he been such a prominent feature of mainstream political debate here in the country. He has excited a lot of people because he is bringing to the table issues that aren't being discussed and he is also challenging, he's pulling up into questioning a party that many feel has drifted far too much towards the centre and even towards the right. Jeremy is touching on issues such as austerity, but also nuclear weapons, NATO and the nationalisation of services such as the railways. He has galvanised a growing discontent where many people are feeling that this current economic recovery really isn't working and leaving out the most vulnerable and the most poor from society. Um, an economic recovery re represented by these buildings you see behind me, which really are benefiting very few people. Um, nobody knows what will happen tomorrow, but many experience expect the polls to be confirmed and for Jeremy Corbyn to win these elections. We'll be here in London reporting, bringing you all the news. I'm Stephanie Kennedy for Telesur. Venezuelan Foreign Minister Delcy Rodriguez met with the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to explain why Venezuela opted to partially close the border with Colombia. No, vamos a reunir para encontrar soluciones positivas 
We're going to meet to find positive solutions. The Colombian state should take up its responsibility. There are cross-border crimes that threaten the peace and security of our citizens, not only Venezuelans, but also the almost 6 million Colombians that live in Venezuela in peace. The Colombian state should take actions to resolve these crimes that are affecting Venezuela. Venezuelans and Colombians at Tachira and Zulia states started a dialogue aimed at solving the situation at the border and to implement security measures in the region. The dialogue was called by the Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, who urged people to get involved in the process. The debate seeks to set the conditions to build what Maduro called a new border of peace. He will send the proposals to his Colombian counterpart in order to eradicate crime and smuggling at the border. Maduro's new border of peace hopes to promote and exercise coexistence between the two countries. As a result of this consultation, I announce I'm launching a new social mission of the revolution, the New Border of Peace mission, New Socialist mission, New Border of Peace. It will be a special mission, a civil military mission that will go across all the border with Colombia, the whole border, with several objectives. First, to eradicate paramilitarism and drug trafficking and to repopulate the border. We'll bring Venezuelan families from all over the country, all youth who want to sign up in this new mission to go to the border to live and produce and to help the peoples at the border in building a new border of peace. The president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, has also implemented measures at the border with Colombia. He said the situation there is tough as smugglers from Colombia are involved in cross-border contraband of gasoline and other products. Correa cited the Colombian currency devaluation as one of the main reasons for the smuggling increase along the border. He said his government was taking specific measures to fight smuggling and to improve the economic situation of border cities. Smuggling is a serious problem at the border with Colombia. We are taking steps to control this situation. Another serious issue is the contraband of imports such as televisions from Colombia. They are not charging taxes to these products upon entry to Ecuador. I don't know where the tax was not being charged, but it will be from now on as to recover dynamism and competitiveness at the border and to protect domestic production. Supporters of Venezuelan right-wing opposition leader Leopoldo Lopez called for a march Friday morning in Caracas to protest Thursday's rule that sentenced him for nearly 14 years. Lopez was found guilty of inciting violence in February 2014 that led to the deaths of 43 people on both sides of the political divide. He was also found guilty of criminal association and his defense lawyer said they would appeal the sentence. The ruling was celebrated by grassroots organizations who view Lopez as a dangerous conspirator. Some right-wing opposition demonstrators resorted to violence Thursday night, attacking pro-government protesters. Furious people were injured and a man died of a heart attack after observing the erupting violence. More protests are expected. The opposition was surprised, announcing injuries at a protest that had not yet taken place. The opposition lies. Their discourse is always about them carrying out peaceful marches when that is not true. So I show you this. What is this? Someone pointing a rifle. Is this peaceful, Mr. Apollo Lopez? You should pay for this and for the 43 victims. We will continue fighting so that these regrettable events of last year are fully punished. Chile is remembering the military coup that occurred 42 years ago, which resulted in the death of elected President Salvador Allende and thousands of Chileans under a harsh dictatorship that lasted un until 1990. Former political prisoners paid tribute in Santiago to the slain Chilean leader, often regarded as the first Marxist to be voted into office. The current president, Michelle Bachelet, herself a victim of torture during the dictatorship, also headed a ceremony in memory of Allende. 
recordamos a estos hermanos nuestros. There still truth to find out and justice to apply. We must destroy the walls of silence that prevents us from moving forward. There are still some privileges that Chile does not tolerate anymore. Chile's conscience requires us to get over them. I'll make the compliance of justice be the same for everyone. This is an inescapable commitment that I have personally taken on. It is still unknown who will pass to the second round in the Guatemalan presidential elections to face off against the comedian Jimmy Morales. Almost a week has passed since the elections as Guatemalans wait on definitive results. Over 99% of the votes have been counted and Sandra Torres leads by 6,000 votes over conservative businessman Manuel Baldizón. The ex-Guatemalan Vice President Roxana Baldetti, who was detained waiting for the judgment on her corruption charges, has been taken to a military hospital. She is due to have a routine medical checkup as permitted by a judicial order. However, her health situation is unknown. Baldetti resigned from her post on May 8th when she was implicated in a corruption scandal known as La Linea, which has also landed ex-President Otto Perez Molina in jail. The United Nations General Assembly approved a global set of principles for sovereign debt restructuring, allowing countries to legally confront the pressures brought on by creditors. The resolution was inspired by Argentina's 2001 debt crisis, which drove the country requested. to economic chaos. The resolution prevents creditors from applying abusive measures against governments. It was voted 136 in favor in and favor only six countries against. It's a resolution in favor of our economic stability, social peace and development. Today, debt is a cause of violence, of inequality, of situation whereby the powerful take advantage of less developed countries needing funds. Bolivia's President Evo Morales said he is confident in The Hague's International Court of Justice jurisdiction. He also said he was hopeful it will rule in his country's favor in a centuries-old territory dispute with Chile that would grant the landlocked Bolivia access to the Pacific Ocean. The Hague is currently deciding on the Chilean appeal that the court does not have jurisdiction. Once the decision is made, however, it cannot be appealed by either country. From the moment that the court took the case, it knows it has jurisdiction, and that's why we must fulfill the international procedures with the international courts, and thanks to national and international experts, we fulfill them perfectly in order to develop this case before the Hague. Cuba and the European Union have made progress in the latest round of negotiations to normalize relations. The two sides have met five times in the past 18 months in search of a far-reaching agreement. Two of three pillars of the deal on trade and cooperation are always complete, as well as recent talks around a political agreement between the 28th nation bloc and Cuba. The sixth round of negotiations will begin in Brussels in November. It is not here to impose models or speeches. It is a framework. A robust framework that not only allows us to enter dialogue on various issues, it obliges us to do so. Cuba is to release over 3,500 prisoners on the occasion of the upcoming papal visit this month. Among those to be released are prisoners older than 60, those younger than 20 with no previous criminal history, the chronically ill women, some who were due for conditional release in 2016, and foreigners whose repatriation could be assured. The island's authorities already released about 300 prisoners ahead of Pope John Paul's landmark visit in 1998, as well as 2,900 common prisoners ahead of the 2012 visit by Pope Benedict. The FARC and the Colombian government are on the verge of reaching an agreement on the complex issue of justice. This was announced by the rebel group on the restart of peace talks in Havana. According to the FARC's leader, this understanding includes a bilateral and definitive ceasefire. One of the most difficult issues in the negotiations is justice, as both parties blame each other for the armed conflict and violence that has left over 200,000 dead and 6 million people displaced. The FARC's leader also called for the crisis between Colombia and Venezuela to be solved as soon as possible, which he claimed is necessary for the peace process.
And after the break, 1.5 million Catalans hit the streets of Barcelona calling for independence. That is next. Discover Latin America and the world in our programs. Telesur reports, The Real USA, the stories behind the tweets. Ataman, lives, know your body, open files. Exposing the conflicts that affect our people. Compelling personal stories and the most controversial events. See it all on telesurtv.net in English. Telesur, wherever the news, you'll be there. An insight into Africa today with Bill Fletcher. The Global African, only on telesurtv.net in English. Wherever the news, you'll be there. The truth behind the power. We lift the lid on some of the world's most ruthless figures. Open file, only on telesurtv.net in English. Wherever the news, you'll be there. We start our world coverage in Saudi Arabia, where the last reports say that 87 people died at the Grand Mosque of Mecca. A plane, a crane crashed into the temple just weeks before Islam's yeah, annual Hajj pilgrimage, yeah. pilgrimage to the yeah, holy Muslim city, attended by millions of people. Over 180 have been injured. Local television reports say the crane had fallen because of strong storms. Nearly 1.5 million Catalans took to the streets of Barcelona to rally for independence as the region's politicians launched their campaigns for a looming election billed as a make-or-break moment for Catalonia. If pro-separatist parties win a majority in the 135-seat parliament, Catalonia's conservative president, Artur Mas, said he would start pushing towards becoming an independent state. Latest polls suggest that leftist Junts Pel C in coalition with the far-left CUP could create the majority they need to begin the process of breaking away from Spain. Hungary, one of the European nations most affected by the thousands of refugees arriving weekly in the region, is intent on completing its barrier fence to keep refugees out by early October. Next week, authorities also plan on introducing new measures to deal with the crisis, namely penalties for illegal entry, accelerated asylum procedures and possible expulsion back over the border. Earlier this week, the European Parliament declared their backing of a proposal of refugee distribution from Hungary, Greece and Italy. Meanwhile, Hungary's treatment of refugees within its borders is creating new conversations internationally. Refugees given food and cage-like animals have helped to create the disdain that some people and countries have for non-nationals seeking to better their lives. Some have even compared the situation in Hungary to that in Guantanamo. Although many refugees are still arriving in Hungary, they do not wish to stay for these very reasons. <coughs> Dissident Chinese artist Ai Weiwei weighed in on the debate saying that the British government needs to do more along with more cooperation in the West, with the West. So I think uh, the Western countries or has to come up with some kind of uh, decision to help each other to, to get a, a better, uh, more sound um, uh, way to dealing with the situation. The U.S. have named three senior Hamas leaders as specially designed global terrorists. More on this story with Noor Harazin, who filed this report. The Hamas movement of Palestine denounced Washington's decision to include three of its leaders in a list of terrorists. They say it violates international law. They also accused of backing Israel's acts of terrorism against the people of Palestine. The statement comes just days after the U.S. Department of State said it had included the three Hamas leaders in the terrorist list. Among the three is Hamas military chief Mohammed al-Daif. Daif was the mastermind of Hamas military plot during the Israel's aggression against Gaza Strip in 2014. He is on Israel's most wanted list in 2002. 
Sinwar and Mushtahawar among 1,027 Palestinians freed by Israel in prisoners exchange deal for captive Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit in 2012. Placing three Hamas senior leaders on the U.S. terrorist blacklist is an immoral act and is against international law. It also provides cover for the crimes of the Israeli occupation against the Palestinian people. In all cases, Hamas confirms that such decisions will not prevent it from resuming its national duty in liberating the land of Palestine and protecting the Palestinian people. Similarly, the Islamic Jihad movement said that disagenting Palestinian resistance leaders as terrorists is political blackmail, intimidation and a carnal behavior in which the victim is turned an aggressor. Nur Harazin, Telesu TV, Gaza. And now look at other stories making headlines across the globe. Hundreds of Italian demonstrators marched barefoot to the Venice Film Festival, calling for action and unity to help the thousands of migrants and refugees arriving in Europe. A small group was allowed to walk on the red carpet outside the Venice Film Festival palace, where they unfurled a banner calling for humanitarian corridors to be put in place for migrants and refugees. This is not a symbolic demonstration. This is not a self-celebratory event. These are not stars who are taking off their shoes. Absolutely not. Singapore's ruling party has again won the snap parliamentary elections this Friday. The People's Action Party, led by Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, has been in power for 56 years and it won 83 of 89 seats in parliament and 70% of the vote. Loong has been criticised for authoritarianism and hampering political dissent, but these are not key issues for most voters. Turkey has announced the lifting of a curfew in the city of Sizre. The week-long curfew was imposed to support a military operation against Kurdish rebels, but also fueled fears of a possible humanitarian crisis. The operation of Sizre, a city of 120,000 on the border with Syria and close to Iraq, was a key part of the government's drive to cripple the PKK in southeast Turkey and northern Iraq. And a heavy explosion rocked a military site in the Yemeni capital as Saudi-led coalition warplanes bombarded rebel positions. No information on casualties has yet been made available. The war has brought Yemen to the brink of famine, and peace talks have not yet accompanied the end of the fighting. On Thursday, the UN said peace talks are set to resume next week and urge all parties to participate in good faith. It's a challenge few would take on, yet a team of 10 American kayakers are hoping to cross the ocean from Cuba to Florida, not only in kayaks, but in 30 hours. They set up earlier today for the 113-mile journey and hope to remain in their kayaks for all 30 hours. Now this expedition is done is being done by the athletes as their charitable charitable contribution to the initiative called the Challenge 113. Up until November 13th, anyone can partake, including you, by completing 113 miles of running, biking, weaving, yodeling, or basically anything else. And for every mile you accomplish, 25 cents is contributed to the charitable cause. Yeah, yeah looks like fun. 3D printing is the process of making three-dimensional solid objects from a digital file. I'm not exactly certain how that works, but a French engineer and professional musician says that he has created the world's first electric violin with a 3D printer and he says that the violin is fit for use on stage. Laurent Bernadac said he had previously tried using aluminium and plexiglass to create the violin, but conceded that the sound created was not what he wanted. He finally succeeded using translucent resin with a technique called stereolithography, a process in which objects can be manufactured by printing thin layers of material, one on top of the other. And finally this evening, the latest film by U.S. director Michael Moore premiered on the opening night of the Toronto International Film Festival on Thursday. The 
thriller film called Where to Invade Next addresses the US's history of war and promotes view promotes and provokes viewers rather to think about what would happen if the country could do a better job at invasions. The documentary was filmed abroad as Moore had promised to deliver a quote picture of the United States of America without filming one single frame inside the United States of America. End quote. There is more on these and other stories on our website, telesurutv.net slash English, from our news teams in Quito, Ecuador, and here in Caracas, Venezuela. For Telesur English, I'm Regan Levines. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.